Hi everyone, it's Luke at Young Writers and I'm here today with a very, very special guest, Mr. Derek Landy. So how are you doing? Hello there, I am good. I'm, I'm positive, I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm energetic, I'm all the things you should be when doing an interview. <laughs> that is a great start, that is a great start. So, uh, first of all, I'm sure most people or many people out there already are very within, within your world and know exactly who you are. However, uh, in your own words, could you just give us a quick introduction about who you are and, and what you do? Um, uh, I write the Skullduggery Pleasant books. Um, uh, I've been writing them since 2000 and uh, they've been published since 2007. Um, uh, and um, yes, I'm, I'm here in Ireland. Um, uh, I'm here in my office that I haven't left in the last 18 months. Um, I'm loving it. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's me. Oh, and my name is Derek. <laughs> so, I mean, you say that they've been published since uh, 2007, and I can absolutely say that they are just a staple to any bookshelf. I, I very vividly remember when I was in school, uh, going to book fairs or on World Book Day and, and seeing the series um, available for the £1 book tokens or, or at the oh, book yeah. fair. Like, I remember, I remember that when I was in school. They are, you know, a, a really, really important part of, of any bookshelf, and I think any uh, childhood almost. And I think my first question kind of leans into that a little bit in that they have been going for so long, which is amazing. And I think the, the the 14th book of directly the series has, has has come out. So where do you find the the creativity or, or the inspiration to keep the, the one storyline or narrative going? Because I think that's amazing. It, it's it when I first came up with the idea, um, and I came up with the characters, and I started uh, writing the first book, and and probably before I'd finished the book and I was going back and I was adding things and taking things out. Um, my agent was, uh, this was the first book I'd ever written. Mm -hmm. And so um, I didn't know if it would be published, but my agent was pretty positive. And whenever she gets positive, <laughs> I take that as a good sign. So I started to imagine that maybe this would get published and so if and when it did I would need a plan mm. so before I'd even really finished the first official draft of the Skullduggery Pleasant I started thinking about the next book um, and the series overall and so what I realized was that this would probably be the best character I'd ever uh, create. And so I owed it to him and I owed it to myself to pack these books full of the best ideas that I'd had up until that point. So every idea I'd had for a screenplay or a short story or a book or a comic was jammed into this series. So when I met with my publishers and they said, we really uh, love this book, we want to uh, publish it. Do you have any idea for a sequel? <laughs> and I said, well, I have an idea for a series. And they said, how many books in the series? And I said, nine. And they just went, yay. <laughs> um, so, and for years, it was a nine book series on, mm -hmm. um, until book I think six or seven six probably when I realized uh it wasn't going to end when I had said it was going to end the stories were still generating enough momentum to keep me going past book nine so book nine came out and I didn't tell anyone that it would continue so i i finished up most of the the storylines and um it ended and then two years later i came back with book 10 and the reason it's gone on like this is because at the very beginning before the first book was published i 
planned it all out and and i it's it's a tricky thing to plan a series because you change as a writer and you change your mind and things that you want the character to do in book six by the time you get to write book six the character has changed so much that they would never do that so you have to alter and flow um but essentially i've been following that original plan and um so yeah that is why i'm able to write so many books because from the be very beginning it was always one big story as yeah. opposed to one story with uh, lots of sequels i think it speaks a lot to i mean your writing quite honestly you know i think sometimes books can almost die down after two because the story runs its course or something but the fact that you've been able to continue this so I mean engagingly is I mean it says a lot about the story itself I, I mean I can't think off the top of my head of any other thing like it and I think that is that's where you hit kind of the nail on the head and then yeah that takes us now yeah. forward to the grimoire I, I hope I'm saying that right and doing it justice yes, which is a self-dubbed uh, paracool and instead of me trying to explain what's going on <laughs> I'm gonna let you give us a little Thank bit you. a little bit on the next <laughs> installment <laughs> Basically, uh, I got to whatever book, whatever team, and both my girlfriend and, and my mother um, came to me with the same issue. It's like, we don't have time to reread the books again and again, like some of the readers do. We don't have time mm. to go over uh, the series and remind ourselves who each character is or what this plot line um where it came from so please do a guide and originally the guide was going to be included at the back of one of the books just a very short like a paragraph for each book uh, explaining you know the the plot um to remind readers but um, I tried, I tried my best to do that and it wouldn't work. And so I, the, the idea came to do uh, a guide, uh, like a proper guide to the series with a synopsis from each book. Um, and originally it was going to be uh, the Skullduggery Pleasant Compendium. Um, and it was just going to be the synopses, and um, it was going to be very thin, uh, and very short, and very small. And I got to the point where um, we were talking about it so much that it struck me that, okay, if I'm going to, to do this, I don't want, because the Skullduggery readers out there, I, I adore them. They are wonderful, but they're also very odd people. <laughs> and but they share something with me, as you can see mm -hmm. by my office. I'm a collector. I I collect all kinds of things, uh, and I'm a completist. So if I have one part of a series, I need the series. Mm. And Skullduggery readers are the same. They are completists. So if I came out with a guide even the readers who didn't need the guide because they they know the books better than i do they would buy it hmm. and so i was facing the prospect of re releasing a book that they didn't need yeah and that offered them and uh, nothing new and they were going to spend the price of a regular book on this tiny little guide and there was nothing i could do to offer them anything of value so i said right i'm not going to do that and so the the compendium became the grimoire um and so it it drastically increased in size uh it does have a synopsis of each of each book and of each uh, short story uh but there are also um i decided wouldn't it be fun if that each synopsis took the form of an official a report that the characters uh, give the, the people in charge. Uh, and so each time you would have a physical report and the characters themselves 
could look back on it and, and comment on the things that they had done and said. And so it would be a, a kind of a live commentary um, going all the way through it. And then I threw in two new stories that kind of weaved in and around and loads of artwork and a, a comic strip. And um, I just decided to have fun. Mm. Um, and because I knew the readers would be buying it anyway. So I wanted to make it worth their while. That's it. I think, again, off the top of my head, I honestly can't think of another book that's even remotely like it. It's something that's kind <laughs> of one of a kind, yeah. truly. Like I, I've never stumbled across something that's similar to this. And the thing that I love about it is that not only do the series transcend a generation or years or, or whatever you know if you started reading them when you was 10 in 2007 and the next one comes out next year you're in a, in a totally different place and yeah. this book really does try and culminate that and I think it's it's fantastic it's interesting and it gives everyone something out of it and I believe the purpose correct me if I'm wrong is so that the final the, the final final book is coming out next year so the idea yes. is, even if you've yeah, never read speed. any of any of the Skullduggery books, you can you can give this one a read. You know, really really feel the entire series, and then before it comes to an end next year, you're still kind of clued up without having to read fourteen. Yeah. Books. and it's it's just it's something truly special. Yeah, it, it's um, I mean, like obviously for me, the 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 problem is, well, I want people to read the books. I don't want them to read the synopsis but hmm. even the people who haven't read the books you know they they pick up the grimoire and they read the no fair enough it's all spoiled because it's yeah. the synopsis <laughs> of the book but in theory hopefully um they will find the story intriguing enough in intriguing enough and find the characters who you see snippets of intriguing um, um enough to go back and actual and actually uh, get the book and and read the book um that would be ideal <laughs> uh but it as you said it's a weird thing to do um i i completely understand that it's a very weird thing to do here's a guide to my series that you could literally read instead of my series hmm. um which is is odd but um, you know, the the Skullduggery, as I said, the readers, the Skullduggery readers are a bunch of oddballs. Um, and so I think I, I thought this kind of thing would appeal to them. Mm. Um, so and they've been so good to me and so good to the series and the characters with their enthusiasm and 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 um their passion that uh at this point in my career as a writer, really all I care about is giving them as much as I can. Hmm. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's- And you're almost writing your own rules as you go along, to be honest. Like, as I say, the, there are no other series that, that I know of that are like this. And so when it comes to writing a, a paracall, why not? Because, you know, it's never happened before and that doesn't mean that it's wrong and weird isn't negative and all of these things come together that you yes. can kind of do what you want, honestly. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. The and, and, are there is, and they love it. Yeah, it, and it's so freeing um, because every time, every time my publishers think they have the readers like boxed away and okay, we understand them now, <laughs> they'll do something different. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll they'll surprise for reasons we don't understand. Mm -hmm. um, for whatever reason, the sales of my books this year are up on last year. For no, you know, there was no yeah, yeah. big promotion, no big, it was just a regular year, but suddenly they shot up. And last year were very good sales. But, but this year it's it's and we don't understand them we we you know they try they try to have their their um their categories and they try to you know have their polls and and these consistently cannot understand the scholar readers because they are they are undefinable uh, they're also completely different 
um, mm. and yet alike in so many ways. But you know, that's that's people. <laughs> I think if you're uh, 14, 15, 16 books into a series and you've still not uh, quite figured it out, then that's probably the very beauty of it. That's that's probably yes. the point. And I think that's very much what this book actually goes on is is that very angle. And I think there's that that's I think it's just it's it's a beautiful angle. It's it's a really wonderful thing. And it's just new and refreshing and something totally different that, you know, you, who knows if they like it or not, because yeah. they're, not, they're to compare it to exactly yes yeah so, so um, one final thing i think we can uh, very much say that you've earned uh, your mark as a very amazing writer and have done for a very long time and created a wonderful collection of books and i think there'll be people watching this that also want to to go down a similar route maybe they're they're writing or they have a 20 book series in their minds and they want to beat you to the to the title so um if you could speak or give one message to to every uh, wannabe writer out there oh, wow that is quite the deep one. It's quite the deep one, but what, or, or one piece of advice to simplify it, but what would you go for? Okay. These are always really interesting questions because you try to distill everything down to the core. Mm. Um, and I've, I've got, as you can imagine, plenty of advice. <laughs> but the thing that, the, the one piece of advice that I always give in addition to whatever else I say, is um, I, I I went to a, a writing seminar years ago before before school degree, uh, a screenwriting seminar. It was like a week long. Um, and uh, I, I was making a movie at the time, and, or right before we made a movie. And um, I went just to, to get some pointers. And one of, the, one of the exercises that she gave us, uh, a class of, of um, 12 men and, and, and 12 women, um, uh, it was basically write a story about something that happened to you um, and then read it out in class. Or you can make up a story, pretend it happened to you and read it out in class and see the difference. Um, and uh, I can't remember what the point of the lesson was, but I didn't know what to do. So I wrote the story of when I was about 17, uh, finding my poor dog who had been knocked down on the road. Um, and I was reading this out and I got halfway down and I knew it so well because it actually happened to me that I folded up the piece of paper and I just told the story of uh, me walking across the yard, approaching the gate, seeing my little dog's legs, and as I was telling this story, I was reliving it in my head. And because I was reliving it, the emotion, even though it happened 10 years earlier, came back. And so I was walking across the yard and I was describing it. And halfway across, my voice kind of cracked with emotion. And every, every guy in the room l l looked away and every every female every girl went mm. and basically the guys looked away because they didn't want to see another man hurt so they looked away out of respect mm. and the women um uh, sympathized and oh my god but what that showed me was that the temperature in the room up until that point, all of the stories being read were funny. They were amusing anecdotes and everyone was in a good mood. And I ruined it. I ruined <laughs> it completely. Story, telling the story about my dead dog. Because, and I saw in an instant, the temperature of a room change and the mood of a room change change and physical change within people 
And that's because in this story, I offered a sliver of myself. I offered a sliver of reality, of my own uh, humanity. Um, I was honest and I talked about something that hurt me. And even if these people have never had a pet and have never lost a pet, they could see that bit of honesty in me and it affected them and it changed the room completely. And so my piece of advice after that long-winded story <laughs> is no matter what you are writing about, whether it's skeleton detectives or zombies on the moon, or if it's a romance or science fiction or war or whatever it is, you as a writer have to connect with your audience. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you make them recognize something in you, in your character and in your story that they cannot avoid. Mm -hmm. So you put in a bit of your own soul, you put in a bit of your own hurt, and they will recognize it even if they've never experienced it. Uh, they will recognize it. You recognize heartache if your heart even has never been broken. But that's what it is. You have to connect with your audience at an emotional devil. Um, and just a sliver. You don't have to go overboard. I changed the room in a, with, you know, with a broken voice. And um, that is now my philosophy when it comes to writing. You've got to be honest. Uh, you've got to be real. And you've got to give the audience a bit of yourself. That's probably why so many writers are very well adjusted individuals because every time they write, they have to plumb just a little bit deeper and expose something a little bit more raw. Yeah. And there you go. Well, th um, that's fantastic. I think you can pick a lot from that as well. And as you say, what's important, I think it doesn't have to be a lived experience. You know, you don't, as you said, you don't have to have experienced heartbreak to see the heartbreak. Yeah. It's something that if you can write from your experience, and you know the story well, then you then you can tell it well. So yeah, exactly, that's exactly. Everyone, it, everyone can take it. And it's it's just you know, it it it's something we call emotional honesty. And hmm. uh, no matter what you are writing, if it's a horrible situation, don't have your characters being way too cool. You put yourself in their shoes and go, okay, I would freak out. So have your characters freak out, yeah. do something real, and mm -hmm. you will grab the audience. Emotional honesty. Amazing. Well, thank you so, so much for your time. Uh, the, the Grimoire, Skullduggery Pleasant, the Grimoire is out at the moment. So if you are looking to pick up something that you have probably never read anything similar to, absolutely check it out you know if you're a fan of the series check it out if you're not a fan of the series check it out anyway because it will give you the breakdown so um yeah that's available everywhere now and again thank you so much for your time my absolute pleasure thank you see you soon thanks